Hello, I'm Tim Wild, and these are my wild impressions for this Easter week reading of Come Follow Me, and we're on uh, Monday, Cleansing the Temple. This is all in the first section. Um, just to reiterate, reemphasize, remember, or remind um, what we're looking for in this section, and it goes day by day of the last week of the Savior. Uh, when the things to look for are what do you find in these chapters that helps you feel the Savior's love? Ponder in these chapters what they teach you about how he can deliver you from sin, death, trials, and weaknesses, and how are you exercising faith in his power of deliverance. This one is uh, short and simple. Um, this is his cleansing of the temple. Uh, Matthew, as you see, 21, 12 through 16. And I'm just going to read the one thing that stuck out to me, and I lost it. Um, 21, 21 or 12 through 16. And Jesus went and said to the temple or went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables and the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. It's funny. He throws over the tables of everything except for he was gentle with the doves. He just, he just removed the seats of the people that were sitting there and said, come get your birds. He said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer that ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Now, this was public. We obviously see that he didn't say that they weren't allowed in the temple. He does call it my house, which is a big deal. The first time he cleansed the temple, at the beginning of his ministry, he said, my father's house. Then he's gone through his ministry, and he's established himself, and um, he's, he's become more public, um, way more public at this point, completely public. And transparent in who he is, um, that he is owning it and says, This is my house, the house of Jehovah. This was the house of God, my house. And then at the end of his uh, rebuking of the um, the Pharisees, he says, Your house, because he's done with it. He's washing his hands of it. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be um, defiled. And he's, he's moving on. The temple is going to be a different uh, situation in the future for him. Anyway, um, so that's relevant. He's calling it my house. So we call it the house of prayer. And you've made a den of thieves. He's going to own it for this week only. And the blind and the lame came in unto the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children of the kingdom carry, are crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of God. And they were sore displeased. What's relevant in these verses for me um, stood out is that he was doing this all publicly. He's always in the past, at least in the first part. Uh, the first half of his ministry, he was always, uh, he would heal someone quietly and then say, don't tell anyone or just keep it yourself or just show it to these people specifically. Um, he was doing that to stay private. So it didn't have too much obstruction to his ministry, his teaching, his performing miracles, um, the things that he was trying to do, establishing his church, restoring his kingdom um, was going to have a lot more attention, a lot more um, um, opposition and attacks that was going to, again, obstruct um, his work. So in the beginning, he had to be quiet about these things. But at this point, especially as the the uh, miracles got bigger and bigger and bigger with the big giant public one of Lazarus being raised from the dead um, very quickly or very recently from this experience, um, he was making it very well known, very clear that he was doing these things in front of people, even his enemies, that they can see for themselves, that they'd be accountable for the things that they witness. Um, I think that's pretty cool. I think that's neat that he was there in the temple and that the people were still coming to him and being received by him and being loved by him and being healed by him. And they were worshiping him. This is just a reiteration of what happened the day before Sunday is triumphal entry where they were worshiping him. The same people that would turn and crucify or cry, crucify him later at the end of the week. Those same people are coming here and being healed, but I don't believe all of them. I'm sure there are many people that had a very sacred and solemn experience having a miracle happen to them, being lame or blind or whatever, and being healed or spiritually um, suffering and being healed. I'm sure not every one of them was at the rally crying, crucify him. Many were. Um, but there were many of them that were just saddened and tormented by what was going to happen because they had a witness for themselves right here that he was the savior, that he was the the son of God. Why is that? How does that help me feel? And, and, uh, and to see his the love that he has for us, because even knowing what was coming, his mind, I mean, he, was, he has a very human mind, and we don't, people don't really look at it that way, but he absolutely does. He's a human being, and he, um, with even with power over death, he knew that there were going to be devastating things, and he was building up to this week. He had great anxiety 
coming up and what was going to happen in the garden. And he expresses that to Peter, James, and John when he gets into the garden, into the inner courtyard. In spite of all those things, the looming challenges that were coming and the, the pending doom that he was going to have to experience and all that pain and suffering and anguish, spirit, body, and mind, he still was taking time loving and healing others in this last week. That impresses me very much. Um, I think I would be much more preoccupied with what else was going to be going on, all the work that he had to do, the governing of the church and the instruction to the apostles preparing his final talks, you know. Um, I wouldn't have the uh, the clarity or the um, attention to focus it on other people. I'd be more focused on myself, the things I need to get done and um, what was awaiting me in the garden. My mind would be focused on that. I wouldn't have the the mercy and compassion and the selflessness that the Savior had to be concerned about other people's needs, even that last week. So here he is on Monday, and he's healing people in the temple and receiving people that come to him humbly and worshiping him. And he's allowing them that opportunity. And I'm sure those people were absolutely devastated with what happened later in the week. But the uh, the attention was there. Everyone was watching. His enemies were there in the temple watching. And uh, he's going to let them have it in the coming lectures. <laughs> but um, you know that impressed me. That's how it shows me his love. And he always 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 has time for us he loves us and he's always there for us fortunately we have the incredible blessing of him not being busy on a on a on a temporal schedule where he has places to go and a geographical location to be and times to have things tended to he's always 100 percent um omnipresent in our lives um spiritually um, he's aware of us, he knows us, and he's always available to us if we seek him out, pray to him, and uh, exercise faith in him. He can heal us just like here, and we always have the opportunity to worship him. We'll always hear those cries and, and uh, those expressions of love that we have for the Savior. But that's how he expressed his love for these people and for us, was by being available to them. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.